long time. Thanks for coming. This is the uh, workshop on the Fulbright U.S. student program. And um, we have as our guest presenter, John Denny, who's the assistant director of the honors program here at UF. And he's absolutely the guru in charge of all the Fulbright applications that come out of UF um, by any of the students. Um, and so we're happy to have them again. And we are making a video. And we do post all of our videos. So maybe before we end, I can show everybody where the, we have um, a library's lit guide for grants and fellowships for students and for faculty. And um, I can show you where that is before the end. Thank you, John. Thanks, Bess. Uh -huh. All right, well, thank you all uh, for coming today. It looks like we have a relatively small group, so this may be a relatively brief presentation, and we can kind of talk about some of your ideas if you have uh, kind of some thoughts on your potential proposals. Um, but as best mentioned, my name is John Denny, and I uh, work with the Honors Program. And I think the favorite, my favorite part of, of my job is the advice for Fulbright. Um, simply because it's, it's, it's the one aspect of my job that I really get to work a lot with graduate students, which I enjoy doing. And also, Fulbright is a multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary type of grant program. So I always learn a tremendous amount every competition cycle. It might be something new about a different region of the world that I'm not necessarily familiar with, or a discipline that I'm not necessarily familiar with. But Fulbright is always a really, really fulfilling uh, experience to advise for, and uh, hopefully, as potential applicants, it will be a fulfilling experience for you to apply for a Fulbright grant. So today I'm going to talk <clears throat> a little bit um, about uh, just the Fulbright program in general. We'll talk about the application process. Um, and then again, since we're a rather small group, I'll, I'll just, I'm sure I'll have plenty of time to answer any questions uh, that you may have. So Fulbright is sponsored by the State Department. And uh, as I was saying just before the presentation, there are actually dozens of different Fulbright programs available. There's a Fulbright program available for faculty members here, and we are very fortunate at UF that we have over 100 Fulbright scholars here uh, on staff that are either actively teaching now or have emeritus status. And they are, uh, many of them are very kind enough to come in and help me uh, when it comes time to the campus uh, interviews, um, which I'll, I'll talk about later on in the presentation. Um, but for the purposes of today's uh, presentation, I'm going to be talking about the U.S. Student Program. And so this is for students who are currently enrolled at UF that are applying to go abroad, generally between 9 and 12 months, uh, to conduct an uh, independent research project or uh, to teach English as a second language. There are, Fulbright is a two-way street. It does send uh, uh, U.S. students abroad and it also brings international students here uh, to the U.S. Um, and we have uh, quite a few uh, international Fulbright scholars who are, who are visiting with us now. But for a full description of all of the um, uh, programs that are available through Fulbright, you can check it out at that fulbright.state.gov. By the way, I'll have uh, this PowerPoint, I'll share it with Bess. And, and we'll we post it. Have it posted. We'll post it on the library with guide. <laughs> Okay, so very briefly about the Fulbright program, been around since 1946, uh, really has a, quite an interesting uh, history right after the end of World War II. Um, there, uh, the initial funding for the Fulbright program was generated through surplus uh, war items, um, and uh, it was a time where we felt like it would be a very good thing to uh, create some goodwill in the world. and, uh, and so in, by doing that, uh, we had a plan to send our, our best scholars out and about to engage uh, with other countries uh, in research and uh, establish good relations. And in fact, when the US is establishing diplomatic relations with any country, Fulbright is one of the first programs that kind of goes into play. So it's really, it's got quite um, a rich history. But it is, you have to remember, it is a cultural exchange program. That always needs to be in the back of your mind um, when you're writing your uh, Fulbright proposal. There's basically two types of grants, the research and study grant. Um, as you can see, it's, it's open to uh, all disciplines, uh, from the uh, creative arts to the hard sciences, sciences to the social sciences. 
um, about a thousand awards available for the research types of grants, and then we also have the English teaching assistantships, um, and those uh, are just that, to go and teach English as a second language. Now, I'm guessing most of the folks in here are graduate students, is that correct? Any undergraduates in here? Okay. Well, the English teaching assistantships are generally a, a very attractive opportunity for undergrads, um, but we have had, in fact, I had two doctoral students uh, in linguistics that applied for English teaching assistantships during this past competition cycle, so that is, uh, that is potentially an option for you as well. Really rough timeline um, about for, for the Fulbright program. Uh, the competition tr traditionally opens on May 1st, so May through the summer and into the early fall, you're really thinking about the design of your project, um, seeking your affiliations, we'll talk about what those are in just a minute, preparing your application. Um, of course, being graduate students, most of the grad students that are applying for this opportunity are gathering data for their dissertation or for their master's thesis. Um, our campus deadline uh, this year is gonna be September 10th. And basically, the campus deadline is, a, is, is an early deadline to get you all in the queue, so to speak, so I know who my applicants are going to be, and so I can arrange uh, for a campus interview for you to go through the, uh, the uh, campus evaluation process. And again, I'll elaborate that, on that in just a bit. Uh, the Inter Institute for International Education, that's the group that administers the Fulbright Grant Program, their, their deadline uh, is October 15th. Um, uh, uh, next year. Um, it goes, the Fulbright grant proposals go to the National Screening Committees in November, December. Um, you'll know if your project gets recommended or not, usually by late January. If your project is recommended, then congratulations, you've made it to a short list. And if it's recommended, then the proposal will travel to the host country, and the host country will make the final decision. Most students will uh, know usually around May. This last competition cycle, I had a student find out in July uh, that she had funding. So Fulbright is definitely an exercise in patience and um, just kind of depends upon the host country, the number of alternates they select. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but Fulbright can, uh, can certainly keep you waiting. So who's eligible? For this particular program, you have to be a US citizen. Um, hold a bachelor's degree um, at the time of your application. So again, I realize that we don't have uh, any undergraduates here, but for the purposes of the videotape, if you are applying as an undergraduate, you would apply during your senior year. So you applied uh, in the fall of your senior year. All of my applicants will be either graduating in December or May. Um, they would receive their bachelor's degree, and then they would go on their Fulbright grant the following fall. Um, you also need to have some proficiency in the written and spoken language of the host country and that there's great variability um, on that uh, from country to country and it also depends upon the, your, the, the type of proposal um, that you're applying for. For example, uh, I had a student a couple years ago that was a chemist and he was looking at a uh, a proposal that involved pharmaceutical research in a lab in Germany. He had just two semesters of college level German, but he was in a lab that spoke mostly English. And that level of proficiency for the language was just fine for his particular proposal. If you are an anthropologist and you're going to be working in a rural area, you may need some really very strong language skills in a local dialect or something like that. So there's a wide variability. Um, on the uh, proficiency requirements for the language of the host country. Um, general qualifications for the research grants. Of course, a high level of academic or professional achievement. Now, does that mean you have to have a 4.0? No, not necessarily. Um, but you do, you do need uh, a good, solid uh, academic record. <clears throat> you need a well-developed project. All of you being graduate students, uh, the bar is raised a little bit higher, and uh, the, the uh, grant proposal is, re reflects a, a certain level of sophistication. Again, if you're an undergraduate applying, still has to be very well developed, but you're not, you're in a different pool. You're not competing against uh, doctoral students. You're competing against other undergraduate students. 
a demonstrated leadership ability. This could be through participation in student organizations or NGOs or you know, really any sort of leadership ability is going to be important because Fulbright scholars are very autonomous. There's not a whole lot of supervision going on in the host country. So being a demonstrated leadership ability is going to be a very important factor. We've already talked about the language proficiency. And um, again, remember that that Fulbright is a cultural exchange program. So going to Japan to look at Mount Fuji and be inspired to write poetry it sounds like a beautiful experience, but that's not a whole lot of cultural engagement. Uh, you, the uh, successful Fulbright um, uh, scholars are really engaging in the community. They're, they're learning about the culture. They're immersing themselves in the culture and your proposal needs to reflect that. Um, any music majors in here by chance? No? I'll just very briefly, there, this is one of the many specialized programs uh, for Fulbright, uh, the MTVU uh, project, and basically this involves um, uh, projects centered on music and uh, music as a force of cultural exchange. It's on a slightly different timeline, um, you can see that there's a link to that if you'd like more information. The English teaching assistantship, uh, this is a, a portion of the Fulbright program that is growing tremendously. Um, there's new countries added each year and uh, the existing countries uh, they have now are, are just exploding with opportunities for English teaching assistantships. As an example, South Korea has 90 spots for ETAs, which is pretty amazing. Um, uh, basically, um, you are uh, assisting another teacher, although um, students that have been uh, successful with ETAs here at UF tell me there's not really much of an assistantship about it. You are <laughs> you're doing a lot of teaching on your own. Um, so it's a, it's a great experience. You're working 20 to 30 hours a week. There's a wide variety of ages that you might be working with in the elementary school all the way up to uh, working with young adults. Um, since you're only working 20 plus hours a week, they expect you to account for the rest of the time that you're going to be there. What are you going to do to spend your time? So they want you to talk about a side project that emphasizes community engagement. And this pro side project really can be anything as long as you are you know, immersing yourself in the culture. One of the examples I often use for, with students is I had an applicant a couple of years ago to the Dominican Republic, he had experience as a Little League baseball coach. Baseball is very popular in the DR, so that was going to be his side project. He was going to volunteer to coach Little League. So the side project has to be specific enough that you can articulate what you intend to do, but it also has to be general enough that you can do it kind of anywhere, because in uh, with the English teaching assistantship, you don't know exactly where you're going to be stationed. They will, they will assign you uh, to a city or a region uh, depending upon your needs. So um, with the ETAs, um, the language proficiency isn't quite as important, um, but uh, proficiency in the language or at least plans to learn the language of the host country is definitely helpful. So you say, sounds pretty good, I'm interested, what does is, what is this uh, grant cover? Well, it covers your transportation <clears throat> back and forth. There is a, uh, a monthly stipend. There's no flat fee or flat uh, 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 stipend, I should say, uh, for the Fulbright program. They have a formula that they use uh, for the various countries. Um, I often tell students that you're living at graduate student standards, meaning that you're going to have a comfortable place to live. Uh, you're going to have enough to eat. Um, one of the fellows from IIE once jokingly told me that nobody's ever starved on a Fulbright. So um, the State Department will take uh, good care of you and give you enough money to uh, carry out um, uh, carry out your project while abroad. Uh, health and accident insurance is, uh, is uh, covered. Um, depending upon the countries, there may be some dependent uh, support if you need uh, an additional uh, allowance for research, for supplies, or a psychometric instrument, or something along those lines. Tuition possibly can be covered depending upon uh, the country. Um, sometimes languages, uh, language lessons, um, or other enhancement activities. Fulbright is indeed a single program, but in some ways it's 140 different programs. 
systems because the grant benefits vary uh, from country to country. But it is, it is pretty comprehensive and it, and it will allow you to uh, 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 give you the resources to be successful. Um, one of the other aspects of, of Fulbright is the Critical Language Enhancement Award. And there are uh, countries that are identified by the State Department to uh, be uh, countries where a language is spoken that, that they feel it's in vital of interest uh, for more Americans to learn proficiency in these languages. And so basically, if you're applying for the Critical Language Enhancement Award, it's usually three months that's tacked on to the beginning of the grant period in which you'll go there solely to study the language and work on your language skills, and then you would begin the research uh, process. So you, it's the same exact application for the Fulbright grant, it's just a little additional, uh, little additional uh, legwork, paperwork uh, for the uh, language enhancement of the work. I apologize for this very busy slide, but there's, there's a list of the languages that were funded for this past, um, uh, Fulbright competition, and you can see that there's there's it, it really varies with the uh, prior level of, of language experience. A language like uh, Mandarin, which is fairly easy to access um, on a, a, a at a university, they're going to require that you have two years of, of Chinese experience at, at the university level before you can apply for the Critical Language Enhancement Award. Um, something that's that's a little bit more. Uh, it, difficult uh, Bengali, a little bit harder to access those sorts of, of uh, courses. Um, you can go with, with no experience in that language and uh, qualify for the Critical Language Enhancement Award. So, the application components. Surprisingly enough, with the Fulbright grant, it, it's it, it's I won't go to say say it's simple, but it's it's definitely not an NSF grant. Let me put it that way. Um, in addition to the basic demographics that you would expect uh, on, on any sort of an application, uh, there is a Statement of Purpose essay, uh, which is just two pages, and a personal statement, which is one page. And the initial impression is, wow, two pages, I can knock that out in an hour or two. Actually, it's very, very difficult to sum up your activities over the course of a year in just two pages. So these, uh, these essays require lots and lots and lots of editing and revising and revising again. Uh, it truly is a situation where every sentence, every phrase is going to count. Um, so it's a great idea to get started on these early so you have plenty of time to make your revision. Same thing with the personal statement. That's a document that you have to be very, very persuasive and convince the State Department that you are the best person qualified to carry out this grant. Again, that can be very challenging to do in just a single page. There's a language report, uh, if applicable. If you're going to a Spanish-speaking country, for example, um, you would contact uh, one of the faculty members here on campus that taught Spanish, and you would have a language evaluation. Pretty simple, it's just having a conversation uh, in the language of the host country. They may give you a passage to read and, and, uh, and to talk about. Certainly, you're gonna have to describe your grant um, in the language of the host country, um, but they will uh, uh, provide, you, provide you with a, a language report evaluating your skills. Three letters of reference, <coughs> ideally all three from faculty, particularly for graduate students, but uh, there can be um, outside uh, uh, recommenders as well, employers, um, uh, colleagues at other institutions, those sorts of things, but you do have to have three letters of reference. Campus committee evaluation, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, letters of affiliation, those are um, essentially endorsements from institutions within the host country. I'll elaborate on that in just a little bit as well. And then if you're doing a creative arts type of uh, proposal, uh, you are allowed to submit supplementary materials, which might be images of your artwork or recordings of a musical performance, that sort of thing. The letters of affiliation. These um, typically are the most challenging aspect of the uh, of the grant uh, to secure for the applicants. Um, basically, what it is is an endorsement from 
uh, someone within the host country, usually a university, but it could be an NGO, a laboratory, an archive, as you can see on there. Um, and basically, it's, it's something that's saying that, yes, we know who John is, and I support his proposal, and I'm going to provide uh, guidance uh, and resources for him in the following manner. I'm going to give him access to our library. He's going to have a desk. He's going to we're going to give him access to this population that he wants to survey. You know those sorts of things. Um, the letters of affiliation are only for the research and pro proposals. Uh, they're not needed for the English teaching assistantship. So. In talking a little bit about the application process, for the last two years, uh, Fulbright has moved to an all online procedure, which has been great and saved a lot of time. Um, I will say that the Embark system is, is greatly improved, but it does tend to have gremlins living within it, so uh, you have to exercise patience um, when uh, using the online application system, but it actually works very, very well. Um, so when you are identifying your recommenders, you will, uh, after you get their permission naturally, you will register their email addresses within the system. The system will send them email addresses and give them instructions to upload their letters. Letters of affiliation are sent directly to you. You will scan them and upload them. Same thing with transcripts. You have to request an official transcript, open it up, thus making it non-official, scan it and upload it. If you're recommended, then Fulbright is going to ask you to send an official copy through the mail that the transcripts are uploaded by the applicant. Um, <clears throat> for currently enrolled applicants, uh, we ask that you apply through me, through the Campus uh, uh, Fulbright Program Advisor. Um, you'll be going to an interview, and uh, the Campus Committee will uh, create an evaluation and uh, submit that for you as well. So, the Campus Committee Evaluation. <clears throat> I mentioned before we have over 100 Fulbright Scholars that are affiliated here at the University of Florida. So what I do um, uh, throughout the month of September and October is organize these camp Campus Committee Evaluations. And they're uh, made up of three to four uh, Fulbright Scholars. The interview lasts approximately 15 minutes. And what it is is a constructive criticism of your proposal. It's not intended to uh, eliminate anybody. Uh, Fulbright is uh, very plain in its language that all applicants are to be sent forward to the Institute for International Education. Um, so in the interview, you'll come in, you'll give an overview of your proposal, what you intend to do, and then the committee will start asking you questions. But again, it's supportive in nature. And at the end of the interview, we give everything back to you. <coughs> Excuse me, I will unsubmit your application online, and you'll have the opportunity to make revisions based upon the uh, feedback from the committee. So it's really, the, it's, it's not intended to be any sort of a weed out, it's intended to make your proposal as strong as it possibly can be. So generally, it's a very, very uh, positive experience. So what are they looking for as far as a competitive um, applicant? These are actually some of the things that we have to comment on on the campus committee evaluations. What are your academic and professional qualifications? So what sort of portfolio have you created that's going to make you uh, uh, well prepared to carry out this proposal? Is the proposal academically valid? Is it feasible? Feasibility is really one of the, the most common pieces of uh, feedback that we give students because nine to 12 months seems like a long time, but in reality it's not. So um, we often do advise students to scale back um, a little bit. So the proposal has to be feasible. It has to be able to realistically be done you know, within that time frame. Um, look at the language qualifications, naturally, depending upon the host country and depending upon the project. Um, this talks about uh, being autonomous, you know, are you mature, what, what's the motivation like, are you able to adapt to a different cultural environment, <coughs> your background knowledge of the host country, and your ability to represent the United States while abroad. Fulbright scholars are unofficial ambassadors of the U.S. It's, it's all about that cultural exchange. So your ability to represent the U.S. while abroad is very, very important. 
So here I'll do a little bit of bragging. This last uh, competition cycle around, UF had 13 Fulbright scholars selected, <coughs> which made us one of the uh, top producers for research institutions. Very, very proud of that. We do have a good, pro we have a good process in place, I believe, but naturally it's not the process, it's the, it's the quality of the students um, and the quality of the students' mentors that, are, that have uh, given us such great success. So, <coughs> Dr. Art Sandin is a um, professor emeritus from the College of Education, and he co-advises with me, and uh, you can see our contact information up here. <coughs> We're happy to work with students well in advance and give some initial feedback on, uh, on drafts of your proposal. The earlier you start working on it, the better your chances are for success. <coughs> this is some contact information from folks from the Institute for International Education, the people that administer the Fulbright Grant. And you can see that they have the different regions of the world divided up. Um, I think it's always a good idea to start with Dr. Sandine and I. <clears throat> but if you have a very, very specific question about your host country, we may refer you on to, to our colleagues at the IIE. These folks are surprisingly uh, quick and responsive uh, via email, uh, and they, they really do a nice job. Um, so the resources we have here um, in the Honors Program offices, which are located on the third floor of the infirmary building, we have uh, big three-inch binders full of samples of <coughs> uh, project proposals and uh, personal statements uh, that are very helpful to take a look at. But about a year ago, Bess encouraged me to step into the 21st century and uh, we also have some great um, online examples at the UF Institutional Repository. And I'm going to show you that in just a second, uh, that you can check these out online. Fulbright has embraced all the various social media. There's a YouTube channel. There's podcasts available. There's webinars. I tune into the webinars on occasion, and they often have Fulbright scholars who have recently returned from their Fulbright experience <coughs> comment on uh, on uh, the adventures they had while abroad, and also talk about the application process. There's obviously no charge to, to uh, participate in the webinars, but you do have to register for them. Uh, so I can tell you that they are very helpful. And that's the end of the slideshow, but I did want to show you um, at the institutional repository. Do you want to, do you want to just go back to the homepage so they can sure. see how to get there? That's a good there idea. You go. So from from the UF Library homepage, you would go to Libraries and Collections. Libraries and Collections. And then we scroll down to Digital Collections. And scroll down. There you go. There we go. Institutional repository. So when it comes up to search, I do a search on Fulbright. And we can find several uh, examples from students who have been kind enough to uh, donate their proposals to the institutional repository. You can see there's an English teaching assistantship, uh, a physics proposal, art history, uh, anthropology, um, agriculture. So a lot of good stuff uh, on here. And um, I'm hoping that uh, we will uh, be able to post more and more of these uh, through the years and I can eventually get rid of those nasty binders in the honors office. But um, with that... Uh, so on this one, oh, if you sure. click um, PDF Viewer on top, it's a lot easier. And you can also print it and read it, <coughs> highlight it. One of the exercises that um, I do in, in grant writing workshops is to pass these out and have students highlight where the hook is. So every time you feel as a reader that you're engaged in that proposal and it draws you in, highlight that sentence. And then see how many of those sentences you find in these proposals by doing it over and over and over again. And it, that actually builds a skill set within you that um, you're actually learning how to hook the reader into your idea or your project. 
and they're very, very obvious sentences that, that capture your attention. So I would encourage you to do that with these proposals if you're going to be reading them anyway. You can read them in, in, from the viewpoint of a reviewer and say, okay, well, what engages me when I'm reading this? Um, and then you'll be able to more um, adeptly um, hook your readers into reading about your project. That's, a, that's, that's very excellent advice. Um, as I said before, they award over a thousand, I'd say even close to 1,300 of these research grants each year. I don't know exactly how many people apply, but I mean, we're talking in the thousands naturally of applicants. So the reviewers are, are more than likely reading a large stack of these. So it is important to have those hooks in there early on. Uh, the last thing you want to do is for somebody to start reading and then start skimming. Uh, so it's really important early on, I'm hooked, I want to read this, I want to find out what this is about. So, so and uh, you know, again, uh, we have I think seven or eight um, available now and I hope that we'll have more coming soon. So with that, what sort of questions do you have? Do you all have any ideas for a proposal that you'd be brave enough to share with folks here? I have a question sure. about the process. So Please. after the do, you do the interview, and then there's time for the person to correct, uh -huh. how much time is it that they have to correct? It depends upon the timing of the interview. Um, I always make sure that I send our program assistant flowers, usually before the week, and then a bottle of wine after the week. <laughs> so because I could not do it without her. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to line up the faculty schedules, the student schedules, and so on and so forth. I always time it so you have you will have at least two weeks to make revisions. Okay, but really if, if, if the schedule works out in such a way that you're one of the first ones to go through, then you may have longer than that. But it'll be at least two weeks. So that's a good thing. Other questions? Yeah? Could you say more about some of the arts related things? Um, the arts related grants? Um, <clears throat> sure. It's been a while since UF um, has had a uh, performing arts uh, winner. We had a sculpture proposal, I believe, probably four or five years ago to go and study in Vietnam. Uh, but basically with a performing arts type of proposal, you're generally um, identifying a particular mentor or a school or somebody that you want to go and study with and making a case for you know, why that country, why that mentor, and that sort of thing. So um, we've had students apply to go to various conservatories for musical performance. Um, we've had, um, oh, let's see. We had, we had a musicology, we, 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 we do get ethnomusicology, those sorts of, those sorts of things that are not quite performance, but at least related. Um, but they, there are, on the Fulbright website, there are country summaries. <clears throat> and uh, some of the countries just say that we are completely open to any sort of proposal, or there are some countries that will say we are specifically interested in proposals in the performing arts. So that can be, uh, that can help guide you if, if you're thinking about a creative uh, type of proposal. And so for finding somebody <coughs> Well, um, typically I advise you to talk with your uh, dissertation chair, your faculty advisors, um, those sorts of things. Um, again, we have, as I said, quite a few uh, Fulbright scholars here on campus, and they're generally very happy uh, to share their experiences. I can think of at least two that we have in the School of Music here, for example. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's all about networking, it's all about connections. So, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the letters of affiliation can be the most difficult thing uh, to secure. So it's, it's great to start working on that very early on. If you're doing any sort of a study abroad or pre-dissertation visit or something like that, that's an excellent time to try to get some face-to-face -face contact and really kind of cultivate. That, that affiliation. But there's no one correct way to do it. 
but your faculty mentors can be instrumental in, in setting that, in, in initiating those relationships. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I'm a first year IEP student, so the way our program works is that we go through rotation and then we have to decide in our labs. Okay. So would I be better off applying now before I start my lab in my thesis project, or should I start my project and then apply for the Fulbright? Well, um, you know, Fulbright is pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. It can be extremely competitive depending upon the country. Um, so I have had a number of students that have applied more than once. I had one grad student that applied three times and got his funding on the third time. So I would say applying during the next competition cycle would be a good idea. And if you get it, then I will congratulate you and say, hey, you're a Fulbright Scholar. And if you don't, then the next time around when you apply, your proposal's going to be that much stronger. So, I, I think to a certain extent that once you have your thesis project identified, you're probably going to have a stronger application. It's going to be more organized and then your, your proposal will be a lot better defined. But you can certainly apply early on. You, if you've been through this process once, it'll make it stronger for the second time around. Did you have a question? For the English teaching assistantships, is it recommended or does it make your application stronger if you're either an English major or an education major or in a grad program for education? It certainly doesn't hurt. We have a lot of linguistics majors. Uh, UF does offer a uh, minor in teaching English as a second language. Um, if you're interested in the ETA, uh, it's great to have some sort of teaching experience. And if you're a TA, that's, that's great. Um, one common thread through many of our successful ETA applicants is they have been Volunteered, either worked at or have volunteered at the UF English Language Institute. If you're not familiar with that, that's something that runs out of Norman Hall, and it's a program for international students that come here prior to beginning their graduate study to work on their English skills. And they're often looking for volunteers to be conversation partners. And all this is is just pairing you up with an international student and chatting with them and helping them with their English skills. You can devote as much or as little time to the process as you as you need to, and it's great direct, applicable experience to the English teaching citizenship. So if that's something you're interested in, I would encourage you to check out the ELI. It's eli.ufl.edu. <coughs> that's a good question. Other questions? sometimes Fulbright will fund tuition to take a course while abroad. In the United Kingdom, there are a number of, uh, of grant options from the United Kingdom that will even pay for graduate programs. Uh, the UK is, is the most competitive country, about 600 applicants for 25 spots. But it really just depends um, there's a link in the um, in the uh, PowerPoint presentation, and actually it's on that little uh, handout that I, that I, that I gave you. us.fulbrightonline.org um, has all of the um, has a link to all the country summaries, so you can check out there and, and see if uh, see what unique qualities of your potential your potential host country. Other questions? Yeah, I can show you where we're going to um, 
There's a bunch of tabs there. One tab says find student funding. You click on that tab and there's a PDF there with how many? Over 100? 75. How many? Around 75? Around 75 fellowship opportunities. If you click on the tab that says how to write grants, that's the page that has all of the videos for grant writing. It will have this video. It has John's video from last year. It has the grad school conference videos series on there that also John uh, gave. So there will be three videos on the Fulbright's uh, uh, process on that site. And also separately the PowerPoint site. I, I had to put, like, put it back. But it it's okay. So um, that's where we're going to put everything. How to write grants is going to be, um, this link will be in there under that Fulbright, and it'll be today's date, so you'll be able to easily find it. Is that okay with everyone? Great. The more you use it, the more we're inspired to put more stuff out there. And uh, can we thank John Denny for his time? Well, thank you, Bess. Um, I'm, uh, again, earlier you get working on your proposal, the better your proposal will be. So you have my contact information. I'd be very happy to talk with you, and I hope that uh, many of you will consider applying. Thank you very much.